This is uh, Dion Fortune's The Mystical Kabbalah. It was originally printed in England in 1935. This is from a paperback edition that was published in 1984. Let's see what this is about. The Tree of Life forms the ground plan of the Western esoteric tradition and is the system upon which pupils are trained in the fraternity of the inner light. Fraternity, brotherhood, that's a kind of a swappable term, I suppose. And uh, the inner light must refer to some inner Jesus, I suppose, would be another way to say it. Let's see, the translation of Hebrew words into English is the subject of much uh, diversity of opinion. That's a very... Nice way of putting in diversity of opinion. <laughs> Every scholar appearing to have his own system. It's fair enough. In these pages, I have availed myself of the alphabetical table given by McGregor Mathers in the Kabbalah Unveiled, because this book is the one generally used by esoteric students. Okay, you learn something new every day. That was one thing. <clears throat> he himself does not adhere to his own table systematically, however, and even uses different spellings for the same words. I see. That was supposed to be read as follows. He himself does not adhere to his own table systematically, however... And even uses different spellings of the same... Oh, I see. He himself did not, does not adhere to his own table systematically. However, and even uses different spellings for the same words. Wow, that sounds weird when I read it. Anyways, I'm putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Thank you, Mike Myers. This is very confusing for anyone who wishes to use the geometric geometric method of elucidation in which letters are turned into numbers. I love when that happens. Boob. When therefore Mathers gives alternative transliterations, I've let's look up that word transliterations. That's a great word. Look up transliterations. Write or print. A letter or word using the closest corresponding letters of a different alphabet or language. Okay. When therefore Mathers gives alternative transliterations, I have followed the one which coincides with that given in his own table. I hope this is not on the test. Uh, let's continue. The capitalization employed in these pages may also appear unusual, you, you're telling me. But it's the one traditionally used among students of the Western esoteric tradition. I'm sure the author meant something other than the words in the English language, although those sound like a pretty good uh, equivalent. Anyways, in this system, common words such as earth or path are used in a technical sense to denote spiritual principles. You don't say. When this is done, a capital is used to indicate the fact. When capital is not used, it may be taken that the word is to be understood in its ordinary sense. This should rather be called, not a forward, but like, rules of the engagement, the standards and practices that we've followed in this text. It sounds very like, you know, okay, let's see, when it got, okay. as I have frequently referred to the authority of McGregor Mathers and Aleister Crowley in matters of Kabbalistic mysticism, it may be as well to explain my position in relation to these two writers. All right, fair enough. I was at one time a member of the organization founded by the former, but have never been associated with the latter. Okay.
I have never known either of these gentlemen personally, McGregor Mathers having died before I joined his organization, and Alistair Crowley having then ceased to be associated with it. It's amazing how very little this matters 100 years later. Not even. Anyways, contents. Let's start at the beginning. The Mystical Kabbalah, Part 1, Chapter 1, The Yoga of the West. Very few students of occultism know anything at all about the fountainhead, hence whence their tradition springs. That's a beautiful word. Whence. Also great use of fountainhead. Very few students of occultism know anything at all about the fountainhead whence their tradition springs. It's a good opener. Worth the second read. Many of them do not even know there is a Western tradition. I certainly did not. Scholarship is baffled by the intentional blinds and defenses with which initiates both ancient and modern have wrapped themselves about and concludes that the few fragments of a literature which have come down to us are medieval forgeries. <laughs> I can't help but think of a Voynich manuscript. Dear listener, if you're not familiar, do yourself a favor. Treat yourself to some Voynich. Okay, they would be greatly surprised if they knew that these fragments, supplemented by manuscripts that have never been allowed to pass out of the hands of initiates, and completed by an oral tradition, are handed down in schools of initiation to this day, and are used as the basis of the practical work of the yoga of the West. The roots of fortune's practice will run vast and deep. I believe that is the takeaway here. <clears throat> the adepts of those races whose evolutionary destinies to conquer the physical plane have evolved a yoga technique of their own which is adopted to their special problems and peculiar needs. This technique is based upon the well-known but little understood Kabbalah, the wisdom of Israel, Israel, is how I like to read that. It may be asked, why is this the Western nations, it may be asked, why it is that the Western nations should go to the Hebrew culture for their mystical tradition. I mean, I suppose, but like, why not? Take a little bit from here, take a little bit from there. Make a nice stew, a goulash. The answer to this question will be readily understood by the, those who are acquainted with the esoteric theory concerning races and sub-races. Where are you going with this? Everything must have a source. Okay. I mean... Who can argue that? Cultures do not spring out of nothing. No, they do not. The seed bearers of each new phase of culture must of necessity arise within the preceding culture. Sure. No one can deny that Judaism was the matrix of the European spiritual culture when they recall the fact that Jesus and Paul were both Jews. I suppose people need to be reminded of that. Okay. No race except the Jewish race could possibly have served as the stock upon which the new dispensation was to be grafted because no other race was monotheistic. Yeah, that seemed to have been a big deal. Pantheism, polytheism had had their day and a new and more spiritual culture was due. 
This is a popular way to frame our history as a kind of a ascent up the pyramid where very low on that pyramid is many a gods. And as you ascend the steps of ascension itself, fewer and fewer gods persist until it's you standing atop of the pyramid. Uh-oh. Shh. We'll pretend that didn't happen. Here we go. The Christian races owe their religion to the Jewish culture as surely as the Buddhist races of the East owe theirs to the Hindu culture. Okay, this is a lot of... Um, a lot of explaining for something that seems to be, dare I say, obvious. The mysticism of Israel supplies the foundation of modern Western occultism, of course. It forms the theoretical basis upon which all ceremonial is developed. I like the use of ceremonial there. It forms the theoretical basis upon which all ceremonial is developed. Nice use. Its famous glyph, the Tree of Life, is the best meditation symbol we possess because it is the most comprehensive. Very well. I think uh, that is the symbol that we saw on the cover of the book, in fact. And I'm sure it'll come up again soon. Okay. It is not my intention to write a historical study of the sources of the Kabbalah, but rather to show the uses that are made of it by modern students of the mysteries. For although the roots of our system are in tradition, there is no reason why we should be Hidebound by tradition. Hidebound. That is a good word that doesn't get enough exposure. Hidebound. Unwilling or unable. Unwilling or unable to change because of tradition or convention. You are hidebound by your petty laws. Oh my. Well, isn't that on the nose? A technique that is being actually practiced is a growing thing for the experience of each worker enriches it and becomes part of the common heritage. This kind of thinking and this particular thought doesn't get enough exposure. Um, I think it should. There's something important about it. It is not necessarily incumbent upon us to do certain things or hold certain ideas because the rabbis who lived before Christ had certain views. Sure, dispense with the old tradition, embrace the new, keep the good, get rid of the bad. I, I hear you clucking, Dion Fortune. Let's see, the world has moved on since those days, and we are under a new dispensation. Nice use of the word dispensation. But what was true in principle then will be true in principle now, and, a, and of value to us, I hope so. The modern Kabbalist is the heir of the ancient Kabbalist, but he must reinterpret doctrine and reformulate method. In the light of the present dispensation, if the heritage he has received is to be of any practical value to him. In other words, each practitioner brings their own. relevance i should say although that's not quite the right word not relevance brings their own experience certainly hmm, i'll think of it i do not claim that the modern kabbalist teachings as i have learned them are identical with those of the pre-christian rabbis 
but I claim that they are the legitimate descendants thereof and the natural development therefrom. Um, you know, I, I appreciate your effort here, but like, as long as it's practical to me, and perhaps to the listener in the now, I mean, we're good, man. You know, I don't, we don't care where it comes from, right? All right? The nearer the source, the purer the stream. I love that. In order to discover first principles, we must go to the fountainhead. Great. That's a great rule to follow. Go to the source. Um, but a river receives many tributaries. Great word. Tributaries. Let's look that up. Tributary, a river or stream flowing into a larger river or lake. Historical, a person or state that pays tribute to another state or ruler. Tributaries of the Ottoman. Um, I'm glad I looked this up because when I read the tributaries, I thought of the second meaning. I didn't even realize that uh, first meaning existed. All right, let's uh, rewind. But a river receives many tributaries in the course of its flow, and they need not necessarily be polluted. Okay, that's a good thing to aspire to. If we want to discover whether they are pure or not, we compare them with the pristine stream. And if they pass this test, they may well be permitted to mingle with the main body of waters and swell their strength. I love when uh, writers give themselves the freedom to really kind of spread their poetry around, you know, because this is very beautifully said. Main body of waters and swell their strength. It's very nice. So it is with a tradition that which is not antagonistic will be assimilated. Yes. These are, these are such prescient words for our time. Uh, and to, to think that this was written nearly 100 years ago is just incredible. Moving on. We must always test the purity of a tradition by reference to first principles. Yes. But we shall equally judge of the vitality of a tradition by its power to assimilate. Okay, reiterating the point in a way. That's fair enough. It is only a dead faith which remains uninfluenced by contemporary thought. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, each of us brings our own interpretation um, and extracts their own kind of value and imparts a certain kind of value into the world. Um, <clears throat> and this is done through us because there is nothing else. <clears throat> Here we go. The original stream of Hebraic mysticism, it's a great word, Hebraic. The original stream of Hebraic mysticism has received many tributaries. Yes, that's going back to those rivers converging upon in one another. We see its rise among the nomad star worshippers of Chaldea, where Abraham in his tent among his flocks hears the voice of God. But Abraham has a shadowy background in which vast forms move half-seen. Shadowy background in which vast forms move half seen. Speaking scientifically, what we might say here, let's go back. Shadowy background in which vast forms move half seen. To say this scientifically, we would say something like human hearing is not capable of perceiving all frequencies. Dogs can hear higher frequencies than humans, for example. 
Um, but of course, the sound spectrum is much wider than our ears can comprehend. This is well known and understood in science. Um, uh, same with uh, a sense of sight, our vision. We can't see across all vision spectrums. Uh, it's quite limited. And of course, our ability to perceive the vastness of the universe and uh, everything that happens therein um, is, is minute compared to the amount of information that's out there. Uh, this is well known and understood in, uh, in scientific language now, 100 years later, but back then in 1918-1835, Dion Fortune chose to express it like this, shadowy background in which vast forms move half seen. That's just beautiful. The mysterious figure of a great priest king, born without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, administers to him the first Eucharistic feast of bread and wine after the battle with the kings in the valley, the sinister kings of Edom, who ruled our, who ruled air. There was a king in Israel whose kingdoms are unbalanced force. Hufa, what is this? Look up ERE, -E, air, proposition, before, in time, who ruled before there was a king in Israel. My goodness, uh, uh, Dion Fortune. Oof. Uh, but this is interesting, you know, um, Dion Fortune is using a kind of a poetic language um, a lot. Um, and Perhaps even back then, somebody might use a slightly more pedestrian before instead of ear. Um, but the unfortunate shows uh, a kind of a, perhaps a, a more poetic version of before. Air. E-R. E-R-E. Um, e -E. um, beautifully done. Beautifully done. I dare not read that sentence again, though. Next, generation by generation, we trace the intercourse of the he -he, of the princes of Israel with the priest kings of Egypt. Abraham and Jacob went thither, thither. Whew, great word, thither. I can do this. There we go. To or toward that place, no trickery had been necessary to attract him thither. Yeah, I, uh, I've, I'm familiar with hither, uh, and they're related clearly, but thither is, is rarely seen. It should be seen more often. Joseph and Moses were in, intimately associated with the court of the royal adepts. That's a great word, adepts, royal adepts. I think he means kind of a pupil in a way. Very skilled and proficient at something. He's adept at cutting through, um, uh-huh. Uh, an adept negotiator. Uh, ah, here we go. Right, right. A person who is skilled and proficient, they're adepts. Okay, origin. Hmm. So with the courts of the royal adepts. Ah, ah, I, th I see. I think, um, right. So what the author is saying is that Joseph and Moses were intimately associated with the court of the royal adepts. Um, the court politics, that is to say. I believe that's what the author is trying to convey here. Um, they know how to mingle amongst the elites, would be another way to say it. Ooh, that would, took some interpretation. Okay, when we read of Solomon sending to Hiram, king of Tyre, for man and materials to aid in the building of the temple, we know that the famous Tyrian mysteries must have profoundly influenced the Hebrew esotericism. 
When we read of Daniel being educated in the palaces of Babylon, we know that the wisdom of the Magi must have been accessible to Hebrew Illuminati. We're still tracing the uh, back to the source of this text, which I can appreciate. This ancient mystical tradition of the Hebrews possessed three literatures, the Book of the Law and the Prophets, which are known to us as the Old Testament, the Talmud, or collection of learned commentaries thereon, and the Kabbalah, or mystical interpretation thereof. Of these three, the ancient rabbis say that the first is the body of the tradition, the second, its rational soul, and the third, its immortal spirit. The gravity of... Um, uh, the text is descending upon me, and um, I am humbled um, before its majesty. Uh, the, the doors we are about to enter are sacred, and, and uh, the author is reminding us of that. So let's back up a little bit, because it's worth another look. Of these three, the ancient rabbis say that the first is the body of the tradition, the second, its rational soul, and the third, its immortal spirit. Ignorant men may, find, may, may with profit read the first, learned men study the second, but the wise meditate upon the third. It is a strange thing that Christian exergesis has never sought the keys to the Old Testament in the Kabbalah. Right. Exegesis. Critical explanation or interpretation of a text. That's kind of what we're doing right now in a small way. Uh, we're not interpreting Kabbalah. Although, let me know if that's something you want to do. But um, uh, but this is all I can uh, um, bite off that will chew. Let's see. In our Lord's day, there were three schools of religious thought in Palestine. Okay. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, of whom we read so frequently in the Gospels, and the Essenes, let's say, who are never referred to. Esoteric tradition avers that the boy Jesus, Ben Joseph, when his caliber was recognized by the learned doctors of the law who heard him speak in the temple at the age of 12, was sent by them to the Essenian community near the Dead Sea to be trained in the mystical tradition of Israel, and that he remained there until he came to John to be baptized in the Jordan before commencing his mission at the edge of 30. The edge of 30. That's a very nice way to finish that sentence. That's like a little cherry on that. Uh, be that as it may, the closing clause of the Lord's Prayer is pure Kabbalism. Malkuth, the kingdom, Had, the power, Nek, Net, Netzek, the glory, form the basal triangle of the tree of life, with Yesa, the found, foundation or receptacle of influences, as the central point. Whoever formulated that prayer and knew his Kabbalah. All right. <clears throat> Christianity had its esotericism in the Gnosis, which owed much to both Greek and Egyptian thought. In the system of Pythagoras, we see an adaptation of the Kabbalistic principles to Greek mysticism. The exoteric state-organized section of the Christian church persecuted and st stomped out the esoteric section, 
destroying every trace of its literature upon which it could lay hands in striving to eradicate the very memory of the Gnosis from human history. I'm always disappointed when I hear uh, this thing. You know, uh, book burning. Uh, it's uh, uh, there's there are and it's the same thing with statue trampling and just destruction of art in any form is uh, so egregious to my sensibility. I can't. I can't even f formulate a sentence. Okay. It is recorded that the baths and uh, bakehouses of Alexandria's, Alexandria were fired for six months with the manuscripts from the great library. Wow. Huh. Very little remains to us of our spiritual heritage in the ancient wisdom. Everything that was above ground was swept away, and it is only with the excavation of ancient monuments the sands have swallowed that we are beginning to rediscover, rediscover its fragments. And same will be with us when aliens thousands of years from now recover a drive from Amazon.com and they take apart our credit card transactions and, and purchases of items what will they make of us? I wonder. Anyways, it was not until the 15th century when the power of the church was beginning to show signs of weakening that, man, that men dare to commit to paper the traditional wisdom of Israel. Scholars declare that the Kabbalah is a medieval forgery because they cannot trace a succession of early manuscripts, but those who know the manner of working of esoteric fraternities know the whole cosmogony and psychology can be conveyed in a glyph which means nothing to the un uninitiated. That is very interesting. So the author is saying that, what page is this? I want to, okay, page five. Author is saying that in order for a person to rediscover all of the secrets of Kabbalah, only this tree of life image needs to be communicated and passed on. And that's really kind of a, a bold statement, you know? That's a truly bold statement. And that, that awkward lettering, Nietzsche, and uh, the source of this and that, um, that was all referring to these... Uh, you know, circles. I was going to call them boxes. It's because I think of them as boxes, but they were clearly not boxes in the picture. Okay. Back to five. These strange old charts could be handed on from generation to generation, their explanation being communicated verbally, and the true interpretation would never be lost. Hmm. Right? When in doubt as to the explanation of some abstruse point, reference would be made to the sacred glyph, and meditation thereon would unfold what generations of meditation had ensouled therein. It is well known to mystics that if a man meditates upon a symbol around which certain ideas have been associated by past meditations, he will obtain access to those ideas even if the glyph has never been elucidated to him by those who have received the oral tradition by mouth to ear, like you are right now. By mouth to ear, like you are right now. Uh oh! So that's, you know, he upped the ante here. Um, and yes, Dion is a he. I, I checked that before I started this video. I suppose uh, uh, we should thank Aubrey Forrest, the modern day alchemist, for recommending this book. Um, check out his channel. It's dope. 
Is the kids still say dope? I hope so. I'm bringing it back. All right. Where were we? By mouth to ear. Okay. The organized temporal force of the church availed to drive all rivals from the field and destroy their traces. I like the temporal force. Um, you know, over time is what the author is saying. It's a, it's a very good use of that. We little know what seeds of mystical tradition sprang up only to be cut down during the Dark Ages. Sure enough. But mysticism is inherent in the human race, and although the church had destroyed all roots of tradition in her group soul, nevertheless devout spirits within her fold rediscovered the techniques of the soul's approach to God and development of characteristic yoga of their own, closely akin to the bhakti yoga of the East. Well, this is all very promising and a tall order to fulfill, frankly. Um, but I believe this to be true, and in fact the case. Um, I'm just amazed that um, A, it is, and B, that I believe that. Um, the literature of Catholicism is rich in treaties on mystical theology, which reveal practical acquaintances, acquaintance, yeah, with the higher states of consciousness, uh, though a somewhat naive conception of the psychology thereof, thus revealing, revealing the poverty of a system which does not avail itself of the experience of tradition. Okay. I was a little too deep into that sentence to even understand it, but I hope it made sense to you. The bhakti yoga of the Catholic Church is only suitable for those whose temperament is naturally devoted. Wow. Let's assume this is me. Let's try that again. The bhakti yoga of the Catholic Church is only suitable for those whose temperament is naturally devotional and who find their readiest expression in loving self-sacrifice. Okay? But it's not everybody who is of this type, and Christianity is unfortunate in not having any choice of systems to offer its aspirants. Well, I'm not sure why we're worried about Christians here. But, all right. Dion, think bigger, man. <laughs> There's a bigger marketplace for your ideas, bro. Okay. The East, being tolerant, is wise and has developed various yoga methods, each of which is pursued by its adherents to the exclusion of the others, and yet none would deny that the other methods are also paths to God for those of whom they are suited. Yeah, so, I mean, what we can conclude from this is that about 100 years ago, the prevailing wisdom of, of an average person was that of a pretty deep close-mindedness. Uh, and I think the author is essentially fighting that, saying, hey man, listen, just hear me out. <laughs> hear my point of view. Um, but we're already on board, Dion. All right. In consequence of this deplorable limitation on the part of our theology, many Western aspirants take up Eastern methods. That's true. That's me. I've done that. Uh, for those who are able to live in Eastern conditions and work under the immediate supervision of a guru, this may prove satisfactory. But it seldom gives good results when the various systems are pursued with uh, no other guide than a book and under unmodified Western conditions. Boy, is that true. Hmm. Yeah, I've I've been I've done the the bazaar uh, of uh, of these cultural and religious ideas. I've shopped in the marketplace, like Terence McKenna likes to say. 
Okay, it is for this reason that I would recommend to the white races the traditional Western system, which is admirably adapted to their psychic constitution. Wow, all right. It gives immediate results, and if done under proper supervision, not only does it not disturb the mental or physical equipoise, as happens with regrettable frequency when unsuitable systems are used, but it produces a unique vitality. Okay, I'm, I'm still hung up on this equipoise. Such a beautiful word. Balance of forces or interests, right? A counterbalance or balancing force. I hope I'm pronouncing it uh, correctly. Equipoise. Okay. As happens with regrettable frequency when unsuitable systems are used, but it produces a unique vitality. We covered that. It is this peculiar vitality of the adepts which led to the tradition of the elixir of life. Adepts are kind of like uh, uh, Dion Fortune's word for followers, I would say. Let's see. Something. A person. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um. I'm. I'm about to stretch it out to make it fit, but um, followers, meaning followers of the mystical traditions, practitioners. There we go. That's a better word. Um. I have known a number of people in my time who might justly be considered adepts, practitioners, and I have always been struck by that peculiar ageless vitality they all possessed. I think I know what uh, Dion's talking about. I'm being falsely modest. I know exactly what he's talking about. On the other hand, however, I can only endorse what all the gurus of the Eastern tradition have always averred, that any system of psycho-spiritual development can only be safely and adequately carried on under the personal supervision of an experienced teacher. Well, I mean, those would be ideal conditions, wouldn't they? Um, the question then is, what if one is unable to find a teacher? Should one not even undergo the attempt? And that doesn't sound right. Illogical, my dear Watson. Anyways. Yeah, so, so that's a bit of a, a catch-22. Um, obviously... You know, ideal circumstances are ideal. Come on, Dion. Jesus. <laughs> For this reason, although I shall give in these pages the principle of the mystical Kabbalah, I do not consider it would be in anybody's interest to give the keys to its practice, even if by the terms of the obligation of my own initiation, I were not forbidden to do so. But, you know, it's all right. Just this once. Okay. But, on the other hand, there we go. I do not consider it fair to the reader to introduce intentional blinds and misinformation. And to the best of my knowledge and belief, the information I gave is accurate, even if incomplete. All right. We get it, man. It's, uh, it's, it's your funnel. Um, the 32 mystical paths of the concealed glory are ways of life, and those who want to unravel their secrets must tread them. As I myself was trained, so can anyone be trained who is willing to undergo the discipline, and I will gladly in indicate the way to any earnest seeker. That's all we want you to do. Oh, wow, so that's chapter one done. Uh, I guess I'll pause here and maybe do chapter two soon. The choice of a path. <laughs>